Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, celebrating expression, fostering talent, and connecting the community to Columbus artists, performances, exhibitions, concerts, public art, and more at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, meet an artist whose paintings are vibrant and moody, discover how artists transform payphones into time capsules, and we learn about an organization that has been offering classic and contemporary dance experiences for almost 50 years. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Clintonville resident Jessica Wotasik started painting as a youth in an old schoolhouse with someone she considers a great mentor, even to this day. She paints the neighborhoods she knows and lovingly calls them the oils of the great Midwest. These include downtown Columbus, German Village, the Short North, and of course, Clintonville, where her uncle Pedro and cousin Sylvia run an antique store that's been in the family since the 1980s. We met up with her both in her home studio and in studios on High Gallery where you can watch her paint and see these neighborhoods come to life. I like to paint places that I'm close to, that I know. When it's raining, I like to paint reflections. So I'll go in the short north, for example, with my camera. I'll go get a bunch of reference shots of areas of town that I think are iconic and kind of resonate with me or I've had a good experience at. I focus um, mostly on like neighborhoods like the Short North, Clintonville, German Village, areas where I spend a lot of time. For some of my photos, I'll ask like a building owner if I can go and get reference shots. Like for example, the folks at the, the Hilton let me go in the top floor of the hotel to get some reference shots. I do use all of my own like original photos. It's not a drone or anything, I'll go high up and get photos if I can get in the top story of a building or on a rooftop. The view from the Joseph is from the top floor of that hotel and the middle one is from the uh, catwalk in between the Hilton and the Convention Center. Then when I get home I kind of look through those and piece them together and figure out what I kind of want to build from there. And then, yeah, I just kind of select a few and just um, sketch them out and uh, work from there. So I usually like to start with a basic grid just to get things into perspective so I don't really completely overwork it and redraw it. Like the under drawing is really just a suggestion and some guidelines, but I like to make sure I get the perspective like pretty accurate just to give myself kind of a head start. So um, a lot of people use grids. Some people are opposed to them. I really like it just because it helps me uh, get a frame of reference and get things into perspective um, from the get-go. And then I completely paint over it. I also like to um, tone my canvas either like a burnt sienna or a, a gray or a red just as an initial base layer to, um, to start the palette and uh, set the tone. Sometimes I'll paint the same scene multiple times with different palettes just to really explore ways of studying color. For me, light, shadow, color, perspective are all really important components of the painting. And I do plan out my color palettes pretty intentionally. For some, I choose a more limited color palette if it's like a moodier scene or like a day scene where it's really rainy. And for some, like at night, in the short north especially, um, it's really vibrant and energetic. So I'll use something that's a little more expressive just to kind of convey the energy and the mood. I am really interested too in light temperature, like there's different temperatures from a cool light versus a warm light. So it's really fun to convey like warm light from an interior versus like cool light from a street light. 
Those are just things I like to pay attention to and the little details that are really rewarding for me. <laughs> I fight with it a little in the beginning and really just figuring out the right balance of warm, cool, light, dark. So I would say like that it's, it's not really a struggle, but it is. It's kind of the problem solving and striking a balance. So I would say that's what's rewarding about it to me. What I want people to take away is a connection to a, a place and a space. I want people to have the same connection and the same warm feelings. Like Columbus is a big, small city. So a lot of the places I paint, people have a connection to and know. So that's what I want people to take away is just the warmth and sense of place. Columbus is just a really great place to grow as an artist and there are so many opportunities here to show your work and really engage with the community. To see more, check her out online at jesswo.com. Next, we travel to Houston, Texas, where a group of artists collaborated on an interactive project. They used decommissioned payphones to help tell the story of a historic neighborhood. Watch and listen how it's enriching those who are engaging with it. I personally consider Third Ward the cultural epicenter of Houston. It's a predominantly African-American area. I look at Third Ward as like the Harlem of Texas or the Brooklyn of Texas. You know, it's, it's a place where everybody comes. Um, you, know, you, you eat, you go to school, um, you meet people and that sort of thing. There's all kind of cool things to do on the Alameda Strip and um, Emancipation Corridor Strip. Um, a lot of thriving businesses and that sort of thing. And a lot of artists live here. So the Trey Photos Project is a collaboration of 24 um, artists and residents in the Third Ward. They're repurposed payphones um, that have been hacked and programmed to feature audio that is from the Third Ward. It is a beautiful dream realized. There's three visual artists. There's three ambassadors who also curate the payphone. My name is Kofi Taharka. I have the privilege, the honor, and the responsibility. And then we worked with 18 residents that are um, historically relative to the area based on like history. Or musicians, local musicians that have been in the community for years. All right, how many hip hop heads I got in here? All of the ambassadors or curators, we all live in the community. So this is not, you know, a news story or something that goes off. We live it. There's three phones. One of them's got songs from Third Ward musicians. Another one's got uh, spoken stories of history from Third Ward residents. And the third one has field recordings of the neighborhood at significant locations. So as soon as you pick it up, it gives you instructions and an introduction, a brief one from all the three ambassadors for each phone. And whenever you push one of the buttons, one through nine, it'll play you either a song or a story or a sound, depending on which phone you're at. So I'm listening to the Jack Yates family right now, and I know them, but I'm learning some stuff I didn't know. Yeah. It's really it's interesting. interesting. And whenever you hold star, it records your voice onto the handset. You do this. When you hit zero, it'll play back your recording, so you can leave a message for the next user. And whenever you hit the change release button, it'll play you another little Easter egg. The change you're looking for starts with you. And if you hold down the coin release switch at the top of the phone, it'll play from an external speaker. So you can hear it with multiple people. And there's something about pushing a button also that's very satisfying, at least it is for me, as opposed to these fake buttons that we use on a phone on interfaces, right? It's fun. Well, it's quite funny. I'm a, I'm a pretty hardcore activist dealing with issues that confront people of African ancestry. And when I was invited into the project, I didn't know how that was going to work out. But it worked out tremendously because they allowed me an opportunity to put forward the stories, the foundation of the Third Ward community. And they did the artistic part, which has been a beautiful marriage. 
My particular phone is called the Traysonic Sounds Project. What do I love about Third Ward? What's not to love about Third Ward? And it's really cool. I also have haikus on there. Um, you know, I did some haikus on gentrification and how I feel about that. It's vintage, but it's also futuristic at this point because a lot of people haven't, haven't seen a payphone. I think there's this sense of like uncanny, and I think that's really exciting. Today, I'm speaking with the founder and executive. It opens up something inside you, like, what is that? I'm interested. When you invest in the people, salvation is in line. I was privileged to have been around when payphones were pretty much everywhere, and now they're not. You know, now it's like you'd have to really dig to find a payphone. So here we have these um, time capsules with our own spin on them, own unique creative spin on them, and they're really cool, they look great, um, they're wonderfully crafted, and um, they're for anybody to enjoy out in public, and you don't have to even put a quarter in it. So this phone, when we talk about Third Ward, it's talking about major institutions like Texas Southern University, Emancipation Park, and many others. And it's coming from people who actually lived, have worked this particular history. And there's no filter between the people who pick up that payphone and hear the stories, our story told from our own perspective. Being in the artistic realm has helped expand my horizons and the way I look at the world and how we can change them. We are phenomenal people. Forward ever, backward never. You're in Third Ward and this is the history. And this is a way to ingest that history and know. We are phenomenal people. Forward ever, backward never. To find out more about this unique community platform, check out projectrowhouses.org. Ballet Met has been a part of the cultural community here in Columbus for almost 50 years. We invited Executive Director Sue Porter into the kitchen to make a timeless treat and learn more about the organization's commitment to entertaining, engaging, and educating through dance. Joining me in the kitchen today is Sue Porter, the Executive Director of Ballet Met. Sue, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having us. We're very excited to be here. Good. So tell us about the history of Ballet Met. So Ballet Met was founded almost 47 years ago. We're in our 46th season here in this community. And the amazing thing is we're just a few blocks away. We have studios and a small performance space uh, right on Mount Vernon Avenue. And we perform in theaters around town, in particular the Ohio Theater and the Davidson Theater. Um, we are one of the largest ballet companies in the United States, and we do both classical ballet and more contemporary ballet, which is a great mix for the community. Wonderful. And so I know people have the opportunity to see the ballet here in Columbus. Do you also take your shows out on the road? Well, we definitely do some touring. In the past, we have toured to eight or nine different countries. But more recently, you know, after the pandemic things, we've stayed closer to home, but we have a tour planned to Salt Lake City, and that will take place in June of this year. And next year, we're gonna be going to the Northrop Theater in Minneapolis. So we're taking that art that's created here in Columbus and making sure other communities can share in it as well. So we're very excited. That's wonderful. So tell me a little bit about the recipe you've chosen for today. So the recipe, you know, I had to do some thinking about what we were gonna bring sure. on to your show. But this is a recipe that was my mother's, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's from the 50s. <laughs> and when people were doing lots of things in molds, and that was what you know you did at your parties. And I've started making it, you know, once I was on my own, and it is a favorite. Whenever there's a special occasion, my friends are like, can you bring the shrimp mousse? Oh, fun. So it, it's traveled a lot, and it's very, very simple to Yes, do. and it's like a family recipe. It That's is. so special. It is. Well, tell us what we'll need to get started. The ingredients we'll need today are eight ounces of cream cheese, one cup of mayonnaise, one cup tomato soup, two eight ounce cans of tiny shrimp, a cup and a half of diced celery, a cup and a half of diced onion, 
two envelopes of unflavored gelatin, and some type of multi-grain cracker, or these days, cucumbers or anything else you'd like to serve it on. So Sue, I imagine some folks might be a little apprehensive to see a ballet. Can you tell me about some of your programs that make it more accessible? Well, we try and do a variety of programs. Some are family friendly, some are not, some are not as, some are more adult. Um, but we, first of all, we start in amazing theaters. We go in the Ohio Theater, which is beautiful to see. Um, we also use the Davidson Theater. Um, and we also try and make tickets really accessible. Tickets are available on our website, but we also have a pay what you want series. So in every show that we do, you can come in for a minimum contribution of $5. You can come in and see live performing arts. And they're, they're really special programs. And we like to see people of all ages and from all parts of our community to come and visit the ballet. That's wonderful. And with the, the pay what you want, do you see a lot of different folks that you would, you're like, oh, I'm so glad that they've come to see our show and uh, that gave them the opportunity? That, that is so true. We want to make sure that we're here for the community. It's because of the community that we can do what we do. So um, we recently had a show and we had people and they were lined up around the corner to be able to come in and it made for an amazing audience that night. And I think as people came out, they were saying, wow, I didn't really know that that was the ballet and how wonderful it could be and incredibly entertaining. And, you know, our dancers are athletes. And I would they imagine. They can do some amazing, amazing things. And they have learned to communicate without using words. That's incredible. And it makes for a wonderful story. Good. Well, I'm very excited to get started on this dish. Tell me what our first step is. Okay, the first step, I usually put the cream cheese in first. This and is you, very like mid-century modern oh, appetizer. No I love it. Right. Okay. Let's so cream cheese in first. Then I put the tomato soup in. That gives mm -hmm. it a little moisture. Okay. Right, as it's all melting down. Sure. Let's see if I can do this. I don't it's hard have to, to keep worry this, yeah. <laughs> about it being so. Doing this, and then the mayonnaise. Okay. So Get all that in there, and that'll just kind of warm up and right. Put it together. And then let's go ahead and do this. Okay, so we just stir this together mm -hmm. and it will melt down. Okay, great. We'll and it in really minute. is, it sort of looks like a thick soup yeah, once by it's the all time it does melted. that. You do have to keep stirring it a little bit so it doesn't stick. Sure. But, um, and to make sure that the cream cheese melts all the way down. Mm -hmm. But it is, oh, this is, this is a great stove. It's melting yeah, right good. down here, look, yeah. yeah. It's great. Okay, so that'll take a, a minute or two to kind of get all yes. creamy and smooth. Just keep stirring right. it until it's smooth. Okay. But so when I say this is quick to do, it's quick to do. <laughs> and these are really easy ingredients too, stuff you could just kind of have on hand. You could. The, the only thing I would say is that sometimes the shrimp is a little hard to just have to make sure because it comes in a yeah, can. The tiny ones. The tiny ones are really best and the canned is best. The next, the other thing that I can say is it's really easy to have a couple of them in the just in your pantry. Sure. So you can make this as long right. as you give it some time to you set. You do need that time for right. setting. You can't just but, whip it up. But the nice thing is you don't have to do it on the day up. That's right? true. If you, if you be don't ready want for to. your guests. So what I like to do is add the Knox gelatin. Mm -hmm. And I do it in a couple of stages because ah. I like to stir it in and make sure. Because it, it, it You don't want any lumps, sure. right? So I put a little bit in a time while it's still liquid before we put in the other ingredients. Mm -hmm. Just kind of in stages. And this is what will set up and, you know, give it its mousse-like right. consistency. That's really cool. All right, so we're going to go ahead and then add in, I think we'll add in the celery and the okay. onions. There we go. And just give it a quick stir. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you can feel free to turn the stove off okay. if you want, but then we just go ahead and put in our shrimp. All right, mix it all up. We mix it up. Kind of a one-pot wonder. It's a... <laughs> It's amazing. And you know what? It's done. It's done. We just have to wait. <laughs> See you tomorrow when it's ready. <laughs> right. Well, and what we'll do then is go ahead and get this in our mold. Okay. 
Okay, Sue, tell me a little bit about the mold. Like, well, is it a special kind, and is there anything you have to do to prep the mold? Well, Sue, so you could actually use anything you want. If you don't have a mold, you have a bowl, you can use that. Um, if you have something that you love that's got a design in it that you want it to have as, it, as you unmold it, you can use that. Okay, so there's options. So there's options. Um, I will usually put either a little cooking spray, maybe a little oil in the mold before, mm -hmm. just to make it easier to get out sure. um, when you're unmolding it. But um, in general, it's about that easy. Okay. Anything you want. I love it. All right, so I will try to maybe hold our Okay, just make mold sure steady. we don't have... But this is a very big pot, so... <laughs> yes, so you know what? Instead of, can I ask you to hold Oh, this? yeah, I and think, like, yeah, scoop I think. a little. Careful there with that hot bottom. Okay, you watch this. Okay, it can go right over that top. It can go wherever you want. Okay, get all that in there. Maybe I'll turn it. Just watch out the top. Oh. A little hand-eye coordination going on. Okay. Looks like we Is got most of it. I, I think that's, that's great. Should I spread it out? Yep, I would just take it, yep, move it around. Kinda... Oh, perfect. Oh, oh, good help. I mean, I'm a baker, so this feels very much like putting, you know, your batter into a pan. Yeah. And then I, I just shake it a little, little shake. Bit. Just give it a little tap. Right. It's ready to go in Done. the fridge. Okay. And you need to refrigerate it yeah. for about six hours, so okay. I usually do it overnight. Right. Uh, makes some sense that it mm -hmm. gets cold and it'll all set. And Hopefully it's gonna be a very special treat. I think it will be. All right, while our mousse is setting up in the fridge, tell me about ways that Ballymet is engaging with the dance community. Well, we're very excited. One of the things that we have is an academy where we teach dance. And we teach a lot of things. We teach ballet, tap, uh, flamingo. So there's um, some variety and we teach students from the age of three to 93. Oh wow. So we have little ones in the building. We call them pinkies and they're just great to have there. And then we also have adult classes that are a great way for people to just you know, do things at whatever their level is. We probably have about a thousand students that will do that during the year. And then we have a summer program in the academy where we bring in students from all across the country and they'll spend up to eight weeks with us um, learning and being able to perfect their skills. Um, we also, as part of that academy, we have a trainee program and we have about 60 trainees that will come and live with us for the full year and they train six days a week, hopefully to become professional dancers. Wow, that's incredible, that must be rigorous. Yeah, it is, but it's fun to see them as they progress through yeah. the year. They, they make amazing progress, and then, you know, they go out and can pursue their dreams, right. which and is, they, you know, why we want to yeah, do it. Yeah, and they learned it here in Columbus. They That's so did. special. Do you have any ways to kind of connect with students or, or the schools in our community? Sure. In addition to the classes we teach in our uh, academy building, we also go out into the school system, and we touch about 30,000 students a year in their classrooms and that's everything from pre-K to a, a course we call the wiggle jig, <laughs> and they're out moving with a live accompanist, so mm -hmm. they get music as oh. well as learn to follow directions mm -hmm. and get ready for kindergarten. And we'll go all the way up through high school. We've got a yoga mindfulness class that's been really great for kids, especially as they've come back into the school setting after being off for a while and uh, also have a program called Moving Into Literacy, which combines whatever they're learning in their classroom with dance and movement. So we're very excited That's wonderful. to be part of the schools. Yes, kind of at every age, you can make, make people big fans of dance. And yeah, we, people need to move, need right? To move. And mm -hmm. dance is universal. Um, we've been excited in one of, um, one of our programs, we even have Nepalese dancing. Mm -hmm. The school knew someone and we've combined. So we're trying to both um, connect with the cultures around Columbus, but also give people, as we say, the basics mm -hmm. and the joy of dance. Oh, that's wonderful. It's so valuable. We're just really grateful to have Ballymet in our community. Wow. We're, we're lucky to be here because it's the community that makes us. Well, Sue, we've unmolded the shrimp mousse. I'm so excited to try it. Just before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like people to know about Ballet Met? Well, I just think that we all need to remember that we are supporting the artists in our community. We have 28 professional dancers. They come from all over the world and they make their home here in Columbus, Ohio to work with us. And so it's really important that we support them and come see what they're doing in the theaters. Well said, I agree. Well, I think we should give this a taste. All right, I hope you like it. I think I will, it's got great flavors in it. All right, I'm gonna take a little cracker. Yes, and just and put just a little bit. And just kind of spread mm -hmm. it, okay. It really did set up nicely. 
Here, I'll give you this. Okay, you thank you. Oh, I'm well. going to try it. Yes, this yes. is good. It's a great party appetizer. All right, let's okay. give it a taste. Mm -hmm. You took a more elegant bite. <laughs> it's really good. Creamy, kind of zingy. Mm -hmm. That's a great party snack. To learn more, check out balletmet.org. Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at wosu.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. If everything you decide is nothing your heart designs, I would keep asking questions. City people make their rounds. I'm happy since we left that town. Out here, small room to follow my own to the ground. And I wait for the first drop to fall from the cloud. But you'd stay till lightning. Struck you Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, celebrating expression, fostering talent, and connecting the community to Columbus artists, performances, exhibitions, concerts, public art, and more at columbusmakesart.com.